Welcome to everybody who's just arriving. We're just we're just going to leave a, a couple more minutes just to make sure that everybody who who wants to be here and who's joining us has managed to do so. Okay, should we begin, Abby? Yep, sounds good to me. Okie doke. Um, so hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Cleo. Uh, I'm a second year trainee at Southampton University at the moment and currently on placement in Hampshire. Hello, and my name's Abby. I'm also a second year trainee at Southampton and also currently placed in Hampshire, but in a slightly different team to Cleo. Um, so before we start, we just wanted to say thank you to South End DPS for inviting us to present for all of you today um, and to all of you for joining us as well and being interested in our work. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really proud to share with you um, our assessment resource, the Children's Exploratory Drawings or SEDS as we call them. Um, the resource was designed with educational psychologists in mind and for use mainly during assessment and information gathering work. Um, however, we know that EP Reach Out appeals to a, a wider range of professionals in psychology and education. And so we hope that this is going to be a useful and informative session for, for that wide variety of professionals that might be attending today. Um, and we're very keen to hear from people who, who've, who've joined us from outside educational psychology, um, if they found some of the stuff we've talked about useful. Uh, just a quick reminder that you can use the Q&A function today. If you have any questions, please pop them in there. And uh, we, we've got some time at the end of the session, so hopefully we'll be able to um, answer as many of those questions as possible at the end of the session. So here is our plan for our presentation today. Uh, we expect it to take around 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and then, as I said, we'll have about five to 10 minutes at the end there for some questions um, and discussion. Um, we're going to start by very briefly recapping personal construct theory, as this is what we've based the SEDS on. Uh, then we'll talk to you about the SEDS um, and how we intend for them to be used. We'll share with you a short example of how we've used them. And uh, then we'll guide you through how you can access them and, and get hold of them to use them yourself. Um, so as Cleo said, we thought we might it might be useful to start with a quick recap of personal construct psychology, which is what we've based the resource on. Um, so George Kelly proposed back in the 50s that individuals create constructs as ways of making sense of the world and making predictions about it. Um, so some constructs are more core than others in the sense that they're more fundamental to how we organise and make sense of our experiences. Yes. Uh, really well in her in her uh, excellent book um, on PCP that the, the view of the self can encompass both self-image um, so that being how a young person thinks that they are and self-esteem as well or how the young person uh, how the young person feels about who they think they are um, and then there's view of the world as well and that uh, describes how a young person uh, believes the world around them to be how they um, how it operates and how they fit within that world um, and these constructs uh, have an impact on our behavior so during information gathering or consultation work we can use um, PCP techniques to explore these constructs with young people in order to help us to generate both within child and um, systemic hypotheses around the situations that they're facing so we thought it would be useful just to give you a little example. Um, so this is a made up example of a potential construct. Um, so we've decided to use clever. Um, so my construct about clever might be that it means you have good grades, um, that you've achieved lots of qualifications and certificates. Um, you put time and effort into your studies outside of school or your job. Um, and you could tell someone and show someone all the things that you've achieved. Um, so that might mean that for my view of the world, I think that people who achieve and have lots of certificates will get ahead in their jobs. And I really value school and my studies and my CPD opportunities. Um, in terms of my behaviour, I might be searching for constant 
opportunities to develop my skills. I might be the type of person who likes to show off my achievements to other people. Um, work might take priority in my life over other things, so friends or family perhaps. Um, and it might impact the way I behave around other people. So I might not value people who don't have qualifications. And then my view of, the, of myself, um, my construct will impact how I think of myself. So as clever or not clever, and that will be linked with my other constructs around being capable, being respected and things like that. Uh, I might be quite critical of myself if I fail or don't achieve something that I was hoping to. Um, and I might judge myself based on those achievements. Yeah, and conversely, I might have a very different construct around clever and cleverness. Um, I might think that being clever means knowing things, having a general knowledge about the world, having a wide vocabulary and being able to share your views and come up with ideas and, and do problem solving. Um, and that may influence um, my feelings about myself and my view of myself, depending on whether or not I think that I'm clever um, and, and will also influence my behaviour. So um, if I believe that I am clever, you might see me engaging in tests and quizzes and showing that kind of self-efficacy and um, engaging in lessons, doing my own research, engaging with homework and those kinds of behaviours. So techniques that use PCP aim to allow individuals to explore a range of constructs um, and they can help us understand our own or another person's behaviour. Um, and we're especially looking at those constructs which are important to an individual. Um, so our core constructs might not necessarily be consciously available to us. Um, and as individuals, we might not be able to easily express them in words. Um, so that's why it can be really useful to have a projective resource around which we can structure and prompt conversation and we can ask exploratory questions. So before we talk about the children's exploratory drawings, we just want to very much acknowledge that we are standing on the shoulders of some giants here. Um, so there's a, a real wide range of awesome PCP resources available uh, out there already. And I'm sure many of you will be quite familiar with some of them. Um, and will have used many of them in your practice. So you can see on your screen here, obviously there's Blob Tree by Pip and Long, uh, sorry, Wilson and Long. And then we've also got the Ideal Self, which is Heather Moran's uh, tool. Um, and it was using resources like this in our, in our first year of our training that really inspired us to kind of create the SEDS. Um, so during our first year placement, we found that we were wanting a tool that was quite visual, like the Blob Tree, but that showed some clearly school oriented scenarios. Um, and when we started thinking about the SEDS, uh, we wanted to create a tool that was versatile and flexible, but also modern and inclusive of, of a wide range of sort of people. Um, and we were simultaneously aware of the, the unique challenge that lockdown was presenting to our, our, our profession uh, regarding uh, virtual assessment. And so we were eager that the tool also be quite usable in the virtual world. So what are the SEDs? Uh, well, they're a series of simple drawings of common school scenes, which we hope translate common school experiences that most young people will have had into a visual resource. Um, we hope that it's useful for exploring how a young person thinks about their life at school, thinks about themselves as a, a member of that school community and how they think about the other members of that community through careful and well-timed questioning. Uh, so here's a small sample of some of the drawings. There are around 40 available um, now. We've just added a whole bunch of new ones. Um, so I think there's about 40 in total. Um, and the settings and scenarios depicted are intended to be recognisable by children and adults, uh, with, but with the projected narrative of the scene open to interpretation. So the figures within the drawings are intended to be reasonably uh, avoid of obvious gender, ethnicity, age and other personal characteristics. And we've deliberately excluded facial expressions and, and tried to keep the body language fairly neutral. So we hope that each scene will allow multiple interpretations um, so that young people can create a story or they can give the figures um, thoughts, motives and feelings. Um, and that can allow the child and us to express or explore their internal representations and their core constructs around school. Um, and that can help us to gain a better understanding of the young person's world, 
but also facilitate some meaningful interaction between us. Um, and if it's appropriate, we can also prompt the young person to imagine alternatives to their original stories or their original comments. Um, and we can think about different perspectives of the characters to explore different ways of thinking or behaving or ways we might problem solve situations. Yeah, and if a young person finds it difficult to talk about themselves and their experiences, the images can be used to talk through metaphor and indirect questioning can be used. And, and we know through research that uh, discussion through metaphor can, uh, can be easier for some young people who've had diff difficult experiences and can reduce some of those worries around feeling judged. Um, as it's a visual resource and flexible in how it can be used, we hope that they can be used with a wide range of ages and abilities. Um, and the questions you ask or the length of the stories they create can depend on where the conversation goes and the things that the child says that you're interested to know more about. Um, so there are a few ways that we've explored using the drawings. Um, one of the ways you can use them is to present a selection of images to the young person and ask them to choose one. Um, and then you can ask some curious questions about the image and explore it with them. Um, so these are just some examples of questions you might like to use. Um, and the, the main idea is for us to understand more about what the child is construing. So open questions can also be really helpful. Um, so questions like, uh, what do you mean by that? Can you tell me more about that? Or just how come? And then another way that we've used the, story, uh, the SEDS is to create stories with the young people. So you can think about creating a story using an image and then creating another story using the same image with a different ending. Or you can choose a selection that they can write about and they can pick. Um, so we're just going to run you through an example to show you what this might look like. So you can select a range of pictures based on the kind of situations you want to explore, all things that the child might be interested in. Um, for example, if you were interested in finding out about free time experiences, you might choose some from the dinner hall or the playground or perhaps in the library. Um, and if you wanted to find out about a child's view of adults or relationships, you might potentially choose some with um, adult looking characters in. Um, and then the young person can choose any picture they like to write a story about. So once the young person's chosen an image, they can write any story they like. Um, and as the facilitator, you can write the story down for them in a succinct way. Um, and you can ask additional questions. So you might ask for character names. You might ask what happened next or how a character felt about something. And you can include that on, in your notes as well. Um, you can use your professional judgment and ask those curious questions to help you get a bit more information and make sure that you're understanding what the child is saying. And then following each individual picture, you can go back to the original selection and then the child can choose another picture. So um, that's the beginning of the story. I'll just flip through the next couple of slides so that you can read the next two parts. So at any point in the story as well, you can pick out some keywords or parts of the story to ask more about. Um, so in this example, the young person starts talking about friendships. Um, so you could choose to explore that construct a little bit more. So you can use lots of other PCP techniques to find out more about that construct and what it means to the young person. Um, so in this case, what does it mean to be a friend? And what does that look like? And um, there are some examples of prompts within the guidance that's on our OneNote. Um, but at this stage, you might be thinking about finding opposites for their chosen words, thinking about other words that could mean the same thing, wondering what might be good or bad about being a friend or good or bad about being an enemy. You could think about what it might look like if you went into their school and saw someone being a friend. And you can think about placing them and people they know on a scale between the two 
and just wondering about why that's important to them. So there's a range of techniques um, and open questions you can use to just understand a bit more about the young person's view. Uh, and this is the final part of the story. And so the child chooses how long they want it to be. And after each picture, you can just go back to the original selection and they can decide whether they want to add any more. Um, and in each part of the story, as we said, you can just expand on things if you're interested to know a bit more. OK, so you've, you've used the SEDS in a piece of assessment work and the question is, what next? Um, so what we would usually do is we would make sure that the young person got a copy of their story. Uh, we very much feel that they should have ownership over over the story that they've written. And so we would we would make sure that that was typed up or written up and, and given to them. Uh, you might also give some feedback to the adults involved in a meeting and you might also include um, some of the information that you've gathered in your report. So as trainees um, and as psychologists in general, we're always developing our report writing skills, um, but we've often included our findings from a piece of work with the SEDS in a, in a section of a report, usually entitled something along the lines of child views or perspective of the world. Um, and the amount of detail that you, you choose to include will be up to you. Um, we have in quite liked using uh, some verbatim aspects of what the child has said, uh, and we find that's quite a nice way to honour the child's voice. Yeah, so one of the key purposes of PCP is to gain an understanding of the child's perspective. Um, so the approaches involve asking curious questions and exploring the constructs with them so that we can then share their views and their world with the adults that support them. So whilst PCP is really useful for triangulating information and informing our recommendations, um, the things the child says or the things we explore together don't always necessarily need a massive amount of interpretation or analysis. And so the PCP helps us to understand where the child is coming from and then it helps us to support adults to understand that too and to sometimes reframe their thinking. Um, so it's important that within reports and feedback you, can, you retain the child's words if you can and the language that they used so that you can accurately represent their constructs um, and to just share a bit of their truth about how the world is. Um, and this can still help you think about next steps. So for example, if a child is struggling with friendships um, and says that a friend is someone who plays games with you, we might think about how we can create opportunities for that child to play games with other children. Um, or within the earlier example of the story, if a child thinks that when you throw books at somebody, you can never be friends again, uh, we might think about how we can begin to adapt their construct and support them to be able to see a way to repair those friendships and overcome that challenge. So it can be used to inform our interventions and things as well. Yeah, so um, as the SEDS are a, a visual and kind of open, flexible resource, we've already mentioned that, that they can be used with children who are a range of ages and who have a range of needs. However, there might be some children with whom you may wish to adapt how you're using them. Um, and so, for example, children who have difficulty communicating verbally, uh, children who are very young, uh, children who have social communication difficulties and perhaps children for whom English is an additional language might find it a little bit harder to engage verbally with this resource. Um, so we've had a little think about some of the ways that this can be adapted um, and one of those ways is by using drawing. Um, so you could ask the young person to uh, draw on the scenes, they could add characters or other elements to the scenes um, or they could add facial expressions to the existing characters. Um, and another suggestion that we've had is that we could, uh, the scenes could be cut up and then the young person can physically alter the scenes and move the characters around. And actually we're in the process of um, creating some more empty scenes and some individual figures so that these options are more viable. Um, and one of the professionals that we've we've chatted to who's used SEDS um, has used it in a sorting activity with a young person. So sorting the images into 
uh, situations that they're happy in and feel comfortable in, and then situations that they try to avoid and feel uncomfortable in. So there are a range of creative ways that the children's exploratory drawings can be adapted for use uh, with, with different children with different needs. Um, and it's our hope that with more experience that we gain from using them and with the experience that our colleagues share with us through using them, that our, our pool of ideas for how we can adapt the resource uh, will grow. So we hope that you are, are keen to give them a go um, and that, that, that you feel confident that you would know how to give them a go at this point um, from, from some of the things we've shared with you. And so um, how can you access them? Well, they're currently available via a OneNote um, and you can access that through a link which uh, we will happily share or through the University of Southampton blog. Uh, there's also a link on there. On the OneNote, you will find uh, a guidance document where you can read about the theory behind uh, SEDS in a little bit more detail. And there's a, a further reading list on there as well, which might be of interest. Uh, there's lots of information about how you can use them, including um, a, a document of questions that you might use um, uh, during the discussion part of the activity. And you'll also find all of the individual image files, which can be copied and pasted out of the OneNote as and when you want to use them. There are a couple more case examples on there as well, if you'd, if you'd like to have a read of those. And there's a piece of guidance that we've written specifically for using the SEDS virtually as well. So this is what the practice guidance document looks like um, on the OneNote. Uh, the guidance is based on ways that we've used them, but we're happy for you to adapt them and use them to suit your practice. And we'd be really keen to hear how you go about doing that and what works and what doesn't work. So feel free to get in touch with us. Yeah, and here's just a quick glimmer of the uh, of the case examples that are up there that you can you can peruse in your own time if you if you're interested. And as we said, um, we like we hope that the SEDS can be used flexibly. So you can print them off and take them into a school when you're able to return to schools um, or you can use them virtually via Teams or Zoom and we've included that guidance in the OneNote. Um, we've also in our own practice sent them to schools beforehand and the school has printed them off for us. Um, so when we've met virtually the child's had them to be able to manipulate them and we've just made notes our end on which pictures we're talking about. So that's another option. Yeah, so um, you may have picked up that this is a resource that's very much a, a sort of work in progress for us. And as I said, we've, we've recently added a new selection of drawings to the set um, and are in the process of compiling um, a, a list of, of, of new drawings at the moment, um, thinking about some more early year scenes and potentially some more post-16 scenes. And really the direction that we kind of take our development of this work is going to be guided by the user's of it. So we're really keen to hear about your experiences, should you wish to go away and use the resource. Um, there's a link to a short survey in our OneNote and we, we implore you to, to jump on there and give us some feedback if you do find using the, the SEDS useful or indeed not. Um, you can also email us at our email address which is just there in the bottom right hand corner um, uh, if you'd like to get hold of us that way. We're in the process at the moment of creating a basic website, which is a great relief to me because I don't get on terribly well with OneNote. Um, so hopefully that website will be online in the next month or so and, um, and you can access uh, SEDS that way as well. So here are just some references and further reading, but these are also all collated on the OneNote. Um, so don't worry about jotting them all down now. Um, and that is the end. So I will close the presentation and then we will just have a look for questions or if anyone's got any extra questions, then feel free to pop them in the Q&A now. And we will just have a look. And we'll also share the, oh, somebody's already shared, shared the, the link, that's great. Okay. So we've had a couple of questions at the moment. Um, so the first one is, is child consent required for sharing? Um, so within our practice, we have started asking the young people 
if they're happy for us to share the stories um, with with staff and adults working with them. Um, if they're not, we've sort of spoken to them about the fact that we'd like to share their views, but we may not directly share the story that they've written. Um, so that parts of the work can be shared to help the adults supporting them, but not necessarily all of it. But the child's always offered a copy of their stories and then they can choose as well whether to share that with adults supporting them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, actually. I think it, it's got to be an element of the conversation that you have with the child before, uh, before you kind of embark on this activity with them. Uh, we've got another question here. Have you gained helpful feedback from young people who have used the resource? Um, so I don't know whether you have, Abby, as yet. Um, so for, as far as I'm concerned, um, I've, I've had feedback in terms of con during the conversation with the young person and, and seeing how they respond to the resource. Um, I think it's a very much an individual thing. So some young people find it easier to, to engage with this, this resource than others. Um, and I think that's always going to be the case. Um, and for many of the young people that I've used it with, the feedback has been that it's been an activity that they've really enjoyed. Um, and I think that should, should be the way that it's used. It should be an activity that's enjoyable and that's fun and that's non-threatening. And I think that if, if it's not, potentially it's not, not the tool for this particular case. I don't know if you've had any, uh, any, any other feedback, Abby? Yeah, no, nothing specific as of yet, just feedback within sessions with young people. Um, but like Cleo said, you can, you can tailor it. And I think the, the, first young people, the first young person I tried it with loved writing stories, which is why I chose it. So that was fairly positive feedback from that because she really enjoyed it. Um, but other young people might find that really hard. So yeah, perhaps that feedback as you go is really useful and then having something else in your in your bag if you if not. Um, so the third question is have you used them in therapeutic work at all? Um, not particularly at the moment. I think the difficulties of working virtually um, mean that we haven't seen as many young people as we would like to this year and perhaps access some of the opportunities to do that. Um, with the young person that I used them with first, I did decide to see her on more than one occasion because she seemed to respond really well to the activity. Um, so we had another go and we thought about changing the endings to the story, whether there's any way we could problem solve something that had happened within the story. Um, I also tried, so I wrote a story and then we discussed that as an option. So I think it is definitely a potential for us that you could use them more than once over perhaps a longer period of time. Um, and I think also we potentially might look at making them into more of a resource that can be used over time for people within schools as well. Yeah, I think I think it's been picked up on a few times that actually there's some some parallels to be seen here with um, therapeutic story writing. Um, and that actually there is the potential there for these to be used in that way. Um, and I guess we would we would encourage you to, to, to give that a go if that feels like something you'd like to do. Um, and as Abby said, it's it's something it's an avenue that we're we're looking to explore at some point and, and may well produce another piece of guidance on on using them in a more therapeutic sort of fashion. So there's another question popped up. When you support young people to develop stories, do you suggest they talk about real people and themselves or use it as more of a creative writing exercise so they don't necessarily write about themselves or people they know? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think generally and certainly when we begin the activity, we tend to uh, use it in a more metaphorical sense. So we don't tend to infer directly that that, that, that any of the characters are that particular young person. And I think um, what we were talking about with regards to the kind of that non-threatening conversation, a conversation where the young person is hopefully not going to feel judged by us. Um, and I think just having that one step removed by using metaphor can, can really kind of help to make that conversation more comfortable for that young person. It might be that you find, and I had actually, I did actually have this with a young person the other day who saw right through that immediately and was like, yes, I'm the main character, aren't I? Um, so it might be that you have young people who, who, for them that metaphor is not necessary or feels silly and that's fine 
Um, but I think certainly in the first instance, we tend to stick to the characters as they are in the story as a sort of creative story and, and use that metaphor. Yeah, I would agree. And if you're deciding to use them in a different way, that's absolutely fine as well, depending on the young person you're working with. And um, when we've just sort of been exploring the images, similar to when we've used blob trees, we might say, oh, are there any that you think might be you? Or is there anyone that you know that might be in these, these pictures or something like that? But more sort of open questions rather than saying, we're going to make this about you, just leaving it open to them to interpret. Yeah, absolutely. That. So I think that's all the, the questions in the Q&A. Um, I see someone's picked up on, are, are they free in the chat? And uh, Sarah's really helpfully responded, yes, they are, they are free. We wanted to kind of um, have the widest impact we could and, and kind of give back to the EP community that's been so generous to us as trainees. And so, yeah, absolutely, they are, they are free. Yeah, and we'll just... Um, post on Twitter and things whenever we update them and hopefully when we've got the website it'll be even easier for us to just post updates and um, when we add new ones you can just come and download those um, and any changes we make will, will be free as well. Okay, I think that's all the questions um, so thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate the enthusiasm and as we say we'd really love it if you have any feedback from using them any ideas if you feel inspired we are still very much learning ourselves and really keen to develop the resource in a way that's useful and um, so please do give us feedback via email or our um, feedback survey and we'd we'd love to hear it so yeah thank you very much <laughs>